It's funny, I mean, these are the same people that say that gender is a construction or a construct. And I always think, well, if gender is a construct, then why is your construct the right one? Hey, everybody, I'm Brad Palumbo, and welcome back to the Damage Control Podcast. My guest today is the journalist from the Free Press, Ben Kowaler, and we talk about everything from the LGBT community to Mormons, and we get his interesting insight as a disillusioned Democrat on the modern state of the LGBT community and our political dysfunction. Make sure you're subscribed if you aren't yet. Do remember to hit that like button as we go along. And now let's get into our conversation. Ben, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Brad. It's good to be here. So you'll have to let me know if I've got you assessed correctly, right? But I've I've followed your work for the free press sometimes uh, for some time, which is Barry Weiss's kind of heterodox outlet that's wildly successful. Uh, you guys are killing it. Uh, but it seems to me that you're somebody who is still very much, you know, an old school liberal, still a Democrat, but has been through something of a journey where you've talked to people all over the spectrum from gay Republicans at the RNC to Mormons to radical LGBTs on the streets uh. at Pride. Uh, and you've gone through something of an awakening and uh, had some viral moments where you questioned some of the woke ideas. Uh, I love your exchange you had with that mayor. How do you understand racialized space in architecture? How do you understand racialized space in architecture? Well, it's how do you understand gendered space, space in architecture? So What's our that? Well, when uh, but so how did you get here, right? How did you end up working for this heterodox news outlet, kind of going against the grain? Uh, how did we end up here where you're doing all this stuff, traveling around America, talking to all these crazy people? I guess the short answer is I, I gave up on my dreams, um, which was the best thing I've ever done, and I recommend it to everyone. I came out here thinking I was going to work in television. I pursued writing for television for a while, which was mostly like pursuing procrastination. Um, I'm someone who I've discovered, like, I need structure. I need deadlines. I need bosses. Um, and I I started doing, I guess how I got into the what I do now is Sometime around like 2017, I think, I got the idea to start making these videos about local things, local things going on. I live in West Hollywood, very gay place. Um, and I, I reached out to the editor of some of, of WeHo, what was then called WeHoville, this local publication, with this idea that I would cover this like gay CrossFit uh, competition. And when I look back at that video now, like it just like it's it's so embarrassing. It's it's not it's. Uh, it was, it was like a baby photo. Um, but I started covering these local events and I ended up moving to LA magazine, getting a connection there. And then from there I started working for Barry like a year ago. So I, I guess how I, how I wound up with these guys is just, I, I started following what I was interested in and what I was interested in was like, <laughs> you know, my favorite way to procrastinate was going on Twitter. And I would find myself getting wrapped up in these. I mean, I never engaged, thank God. I was like, I was a spectator. But I I would see things, I would see stories being reported that just didn't sort of make sense to me. And a lot of it had to do with LGBT stuff. Um, I, uh, I, there was, there were, there were stories about, um, you know, I, I came out like when I was 14, I was like, a, I was an activist -y kid. I was, I felt like I was sort of fighting for uh, marriage equality in my small way and gay rights. And I, we were successful in that. But then it seemed like um, thing, it seemed around like 2018, 2019, um, there seemed to be a real kind of dogmatism taking over the LGBT community or the activist community. Um, and I don't know what the early sort of stories were, but they were probably about like professors who were being pressured into echoing some of the language of the queer movement. And I think the first thing that kind of struck me as odd was this idea of non-binariness, which I like, don't get me wrong, call yourself whatever you want, live however you want to be. I, I, I'm not one of these people that says that, you know, no, I mean, you know, non-binary people exist. Like there's a tribe out there that calls themselves non-binary, right? But this to me has always read like a cultural tribe as opposed to an immutable characteristic. And I started being sort of alarmed when I saw, um, I saw this ideology being um, parroted by 
by organizations as if it were true. Um, it's funny. I mean, these are the same people that say that gender is a construction or a construct. And I always think, well, if gender is a construct, then why is your construct the right one? <laughs> you know, why should that be the thing that's that's being taught to children, for instance? Um, so that's sort of what got me. I, I was just I, I felt um, somewhat implicated in this because I identify as LGBT. I identify as gay anyway, and I'm now represented by these letters. And I, I can see these letters becoming a... Um, a liability for the left um, because of some of the things that are that are being pushed, and I feel lucky that like I, that I managed to tr transfer myself into uh, work where I get to talk about these things, among others. Yeah. yeah, well, and one of the things you do that's really interesting is you just talk to people. You talk to all sorts of different people. So you went on grinder at the rnc and we've got to talk about this how did you get the idea to pull up grinder at the republican it was an National assignment. Convention? oh i never would have thought of doing this myself brad of course but i was assigned to look up grinder because um my boss barry had had seen this tweet which now turns out to have been a joke it's from one of these uh accounts that doesn't understand that like you can't just say something plausible that isn't true for it to be satire it has to be you have to sort of elevate it to the point of ridiculousness where like that's how satire is anyway so there was some viral tweet that said like that some executive at Grindr had said that the RNC was like Grindr Super Bowl. Which maybe now that I think of it is kind of ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> but like all these news organizations like thought like, oh, my God, this must be true. So uh, I went I went on there. And yeah, I mean, there were there were people from at the, there who are at the RNC because you're always obviously going to get an influx of people whenever sort of an event comes to town. Um, how, so, so how active was it? Was it like a normal amount of profiles or was like, dang, this is possible. Certainly, I certainly don't know what I'd be comparing it to Brad, of course. Oh, okay. Um, you would but, never use such an app. Uh, yeah. Uh, how active, but it wasn't active enough for, for me to seal the deal. I'll say that when you I, were I, trying to, well, I mean, you know, I was supposed <laughs> to have the whole grinder experience. This is journalism, Brad. You do what the assignment is. Of course. Um, they, she actually wanted me to, I, I think, to find some people who would let me interview them about the grinder scene at the RNC, and um, I did. I did find one one guy who uh, who who I got to go on camera and and talk. He said, you know, that actually what he's been seeing were liberal people like trying to out people from the RNC at or for, out people that they met on Grinder from the RNC, and um, that which, wouldn't shock me to be honest. There's would, a it, would not shock me. Liberal gays, a lot of them have real hate boners for gay Republicans. It's a thing, especially in D.C. where they're very political. Uh, but a lot of them also have like a weird, they're kind of into it too. It's like a, it's a love-hate thing. The the liberal gays or the dem gay Democratic staffers hate the gay Republicans, but they're also interestingly obsessed with them in yeah. my experience. Well, so I mean, if you're someone who likes to argue, like, yeah. <laughs> great. Um, I, I am curious, right? Because I think there's there's two ways to look at this phenomenon, which is the rise of gay Republicans and of pro-gay sentiment in the Republican Party. There, there's a couple of ways to look at this. One would be kind of the liberal view, which is, wow, look at all these self-hating pick-me gays, uh, hoping that the oppressors will, if they lick their boot enough, won't stomp on their throat. And I guess the other one, which I'm much more sympathetic to, is that it's actually a sign of progress. That you can have gay people who are both Republicans and Democrats in increasingly large numbers because it means that the Republican Party has become more accepting of gay people, that they then have the opportunity to be individuals with different views on things like taxes, guns, abortion, foreign policy, all this stuff. So I definitely think it's more of the latter, but especially as somebody who's still, you know, more of the left, I, I would love to know what you think about it. Well, I, I think they lost and... And now, and gay people, there are plenty of gay people that want low taxes as well. And now they don't have to be so self-hating about it, or they don't have to be charged with being self-hating if they join the Republican Party, because... I mean, they still will be, but it's just less true. <laughs> sure, sure. As a number of these people said, who I interviewed at the RNC, they said, you know, thanks to Donald Trump, you know, at his behest, our platform no longer contains any anti-gay language. And I'm not so sure how true it is that it's due to Donald Trump. Maybe maybe it is. I didn't look into it. But it is true that that platform 
does not contain any anti-gay language. And if that was at Donald Trump's behest, then like good on him for having the political awareness to realize that like that's not you you're going to get way more followers if you lay off the anti-gay stuff. People got I think people accepted it. People got sick of fighting this battle. And I mean, who knows? I know a lot of liberals are really concerned that the, the Supreme Court is going to overturn gay marriage. And I I guess I don't really have the inside knowledge to predict whether or not that's going to happen. But I don't I I just don't know why they would. It would make them it would make them I don't seem think they people. will. Uh, and also, even if they did, it's still federal law because of the Respect for Marriage Act, the bipartisan that's law true. that was passed. So yes. it, overturning it would have no effect. And Trump has no intention of getting rid of the Respect for Marriage Act. It's if you ask me, it's a lot of fear mongering, the stuff about they're coming for gay marriage, Project 2025, all this stuff. I think the more complicated question is is issues of trans rights, where there really is a huge difference between the two parties' platforms. But part of it is like, all right, well, do gay Republicans really have any obligation to be on board with the full trans agenda? I mean, I'm not. I'm somebody who's a you know, center right person, a moderate Republican. I don't even really identify as a Republican, but I vote Republican sometimes. Um, I don't support medically transitioning minors. I don't support yeah, uh, I think that males I think so. and women's sports. I do support equal rights and dignity for everybody and adults having the freedom to live their life. But there's this expectation of gay Republicans that they're somehow traitors if they're not supporting the political side that is in complete lockstep with the trans community, the trans activist community. And I just don't really buy that personally. Well, I think that I think that once I I think that once there are more lawsuits suing doctors for uh, the effects of transition in youth, I feel like you'll probably see a shift in that. Most liberals, I don't think, are behind this stuff. P people who people who are just not aware of of uh, some of the things that that trans activists are pushing for. I mean, the women in sport, the men and women's sport, biological males and women's sports thing is just so politically unpopular. I just don't I, I, I look at the trans activist community, community and I'm like, what, do, do you really think this is good? People are not going to go for this. You know, the best argument against regulating um, youth gender medicine, if you want to call it that is look we don't want to we want we don't want the government inserting itself between women and their doctors we don't want the government inserting themselves between doctors and kids we don't want the government inserting themselves between doctors and patients is is basically is is the best argument for it however you know are 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 you supportive or are people supportive of of laws banning say conversion therapy which has shown to be getting between doctors and, and their patients I mean, right yeah i mean that's that's that is i mean you have gay people who are fully in support of conversion, of banning conversion therapy, but in the same breath, now it's paired with, um, with banning, uh, you know, or, or they're calling conversion therapy, any therapy that doesn't affirm a kid's gender. And I don't think those two are in the same camps. No, look, I'm, yeah. I'm somebody who's a libertarian at heart, so I completely support the rights of adults to live however they want. But obviously, you know, when we, children don't have unlimited freedom like one of the only things the government and pretty much everyone agrees on is responsible for is protecting children right i i don't find that argument i mean i understand it right that you want to defer to parents as much as possible but there is always there has always been a limit so the, the question is just whether this stuff is within the limit or not and for me it's outside the limit of what parents should be allowed to do and for a long time, I got when especially when I was living in D.C., so much hate for from liberal gays for uh, I actually got hounded out of a gay men's soccer league because apparently my I remember opinions, reading that. Yes. My opinions that. made a hypothetical future trans. There weren't any, but a hypo a hypothetical future trans member would be unsafe because of my opinions. So, but I do agree with you. The tide is turning on that issue. Five years ago, when I was saying exactly what I'm saying now, I was like edgy. And now that's increasingly the mainstream opinion that this is published in the New York Times now. I mean, exactly. it's so it's become sayable, which I, I, in one sense, I'm happy about. On the other yeah. sense, I kind of resent them. I'm like, oh, well, are they ever going to I mean, acknowledge yes, that we true. were right? Like, they don't really do that. It's kind of like, uh, to be honest with you, it reminds me of the situation with Biden where people in right of center media for years have been pointing out his cognitive decline. And we were called like fake news, cheap yeah. fakes, all this stuff. Yeah. 
And now like on a dime, the mainstream media switched and acknowledged it so much so that he dropped out. And are they ever going to go on any sort of like apology tour or recognize that? No, they're just going to move on. So on one hand, on these kinds of issues, I'm always happy to see like the correct or true thing win out. But on the other hand, I do get a little bitchy and resentful about it. Like, okay, I wrote in like 2017 that that children shouldn't be medically transitioning. And I got so much hate for it. And now everyone's coming around to this position. Welcome, I guess. Well, Better late than never. things work. I mean, it's 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 infuriating. It also seems to be part of the human condition that when there is something that it just takes a while for views to become acceptable. I guess the difference or what makes this unique is that there's such a there seems to be such a bullying approach from trans activists that I that you didn't see with gay activists. I don't think. Have I mean, you gotten backlash we... from LGBT activists in the community for some of the coverage you've done that question? No, I mean, that's fun. I think I'm sure there are people who just don't talk to me anymore. I feel, I mean, maybe it's in my head. I feel an estrangement with some of my friends. Um, I have a very close, very smart gay friend who disagrees with me about this youth gender stuff, and it, it, uh, it baffles me. And his argument is, you is you're not a doctor. You know, you don't. Who, who are you to say the government should, that's what I said, get between patients and doctors. And um, I wonder what he'd say to the conversion therapy argument, because I know he's against it, but, you know, it's... But he, would, but he would, I'm sure he would go down the line of, well, the experts think conversion therapy doesn't work. And the experts all say that, that children, the, child medicine right. is proven right. safe and effective, which of course is not true, but has become a talking point. But you do have the egg, but expert, but he's right. He would be right because experts like the, I think the American Medical Association, Endocrine Society, or well, American he would only be right whatever. in a narrow U.S. context. If sure. you zoom out and you look at the CAS review, you look at Sweden. Okay, but before the CAS review, the the experts in England were allowing this to happen. I mean, you have right. do, you have doctors who are saying, for whatever reason, this is effective and safe, and it's very hard to get a normie who's not like sitting on Twitter, like scrolling through all this stuff to say, okay, yeah, based on what you're saying, Ben, guy who sits on Twitter, um, yes, right. you're right. But, the, but yeah. a lot of these institutions had jumped the gun on it, right? They were yeah. making claims about its efficacy and safety that weren't actually borne out by the data, in part because of ideological pressure and capture. But I agree with you, it's, it's pretty hard to make that case to normies. They're just like, oh, the AMA says this is right. safe, so why wouldn't I believe them, right? That's a credible mainstream what's, group. What's really... I mean, unfortunate about this, aside from itself, is that once you have, once you can see like ideological capture in an organization like the American Medical Association, suddenly like you don't know who to trust about anything. And then you end up, you just end up questioning things. It's and suddenly you admit to your father that you're like RFK curious and he's yelling at you. And you're like, well, yeah, but I just don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you, I get that sentiment totally. It can be disorienting once you, the first time you realize that experts were wrong or that Dr. Fauci wasn't quite honest about everything. It's like, hold, hold on, now am I going to, do I have to question everything? Do I have to second guess everything? But you do have to be careful with that because if you're too open-minded, your brain can fall out and you end up down like the Candace Owens rabbit hole where she's uh, questioning a bunch of stuff about the Holocaust and all the and you you get to a dark place pretty quickly if you go too far down. But a healthy dose of skepticism, you know, well, whether something's a poison or a medicine is often a question of dose. And I would say that that's uh, the, the the true for skepticism as well. So I can understand that though. I really can. It's disorienting the first time you discover that there's this capture. I mean, I remember. So my boyfriend, uh, my long-term partner, he's a pediatrician, and we get the uh, the journal Pediatrics delivered to us uh, from the AMA, and it's supposed to be this prestigious peer-reviewed thing. And they sent out this article that was in their peer-reviewed, prestigious research journal, whatever, about youth gender medicine, making all of these claims that I I know aren't aren't really true because I've followed the work of people like Jesse Single, who've kind of gone through. And so then when I went to look at, all right, well, what are their sources? Their hyperlinks were broken on the article. So like the, they didn't even have the correct sources linked. So I'm like, so the editors didn't even fact check this, right? Because if they'd fact checked it, they would have noticed that this link doesn't go to the correct source. And I'm like, yeah. holy crap, this is supposed to be a prestigious journal. And this yeah. is not even getting basic fact checking. 
something's gone very wrong. But of course, I'm not going to start like thinking that everything about modern medicine is a lie either. Obviously, it's not. So it is really disorienting. I really resonate with what you just said. And it is quite a gift to your camp. I mean, if you, I know you don't quite identify as a Republican, but the whole thing is is really a gift to Republicans because while the Democrats are pretending that they support these things, even though in, in private, people are saying like, this seems kind of weird, you know, that the Republicans have been able to take the moral high ground on this issue. And it's hard to argue with like, well, we're the party that protects children from being sterilized by doctors who are cowed by activists, you know? So yeah, it is. It's a weak spot. It's a real vulnerability for Democrats, some of the more extreme trans stuff. Uh, but I, I think the activist base just wields too much power and they might have to get punished for it a couple times before they learn a lesson. I do want to ask you about something. You, else. What do you have in mind? <laughs> <laughs> I thought about that when I was saying it. Uh, I don't know about that, but <laughs> this isn't San Francisco's pride. Um <laughs> So I want to ask you, we're going to roll a clip here of you uh, speaking to Mormons about homosexuality. You said you were gay. Did you not know I was gay? Uh, I mean, I don't tend to make assumptions. Okay, yeah, but, you know, did did it not occur? Did you not think I was before we started talking? I've met weirder people who are straight. (laughs) Homosexual practices, right, are looked down on in the church. You cannot technically, you will be, you know, potentially chastised. Because in the rules of our church, you know. I feel like you should be chastised if you do it in the church during a ceremony. Yeah, that's wrong. Like that would be. Well, I mean, hey, you can I get. I could it. see being seriously reprimanded. Are there gays in the in the uh, LDS that, that you're aware of? You know, so I, you know, I was. And uh, will you bring them out here, please? I'll do the call. Just kidding. <laughs> when I was in New York, um, and I, I was partially a member out there, uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, LGBT members out there. I, I don't know what the experience out here in Utah is, of course. It's obviously a big topic and something, you know, I think the church and people are trying to figure out. I just don't think that if it's inherently not damaging anybody else, you shouldn't be judged for it. Yeah. Which is a strange view to have. I think a lot of people disagree with that. A lot of people are held by these prejudices found inside maybe the scriptures or maybe decided by other institutions. Do you think they should change it? I mean, do you think they should say, let, like, I guess the equivalent would be letting gay people get married in the church? Well, yeah, so the question is, do I think they should change the laws of God as it pertains to people with homosexuality? I have so many friends that are, that, you know, that are homosexual and I, I want them to be happy. Yeah. I want them to be happy. To, I have no impact on what the church changes or doesn't change, but I don't suspect the church will be changing it anytime either. soon. So. You're very productive, generally happy, certainly very nice people. It's just terrible for the for the ones of you that turn out gay. I mean, just the same with the with the Orthodox Jews or whatever. Like, you know. So you got a great thing going. The gays suffer. Do you think what I'm saying is accurate? Um, I don't want to give you a, a yes. <laughs> I try to avoid, you know being yeah. recorded giving definite answers you know okay uh for Can you give us a nod and a wink self- to the camera <laughs> productive generally happy certainly very nice people it's just terrible for the for the ones of you that turn out gay i mean just the same with the with the orthodox jews or whatever like you know so you got a great thing going the gays suffer do you think what i'm saying is accurate um i don't want to give you a, a yes i try to avoid you know, being yeah. recorded, giving definite answers, you know? Okay. Uh, for Can you give us a nod and a wink self- to the camera? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so talk me through this. I mean, some people, I'm not one of this camp, but there's a lot of talk about the dangers of platforming and how you shouldn't speak to people who have some views. Or, But you're, you're willing to go up and speak to somebody who thinks that you and me, just because of who we are and how we love, is degenerate and disordered and immoral and sinful and you'll just talk to them about well, it. I agree with them about all that. <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> so t- no, no, in all seriousness though, talk to me about this. What value do you see in these kinds of conversations? I think people are interesting generally. I and I really I'm you know the person I was talking to in that clip, this is someone who I mean, it wasn't even quite fair because I was talking to the least mormon Mormon I could find. I mean, he, he, it was not like I sought him out, but he was just very appealing and interesting and thoughtful. And this was someone who was saying, like, I don't really think there's a big deal with homosexuality. Um, and so, you know, he sort of 
but even someone who who does think it is immoral and sinful and horrible i mean is it not interesting that uh, that people can come to hold these beliefs because of the tribes that they're in and is it not interesting to see how they respond when you challenge them and try and sort of get them to acknowledge that their beliefs are a product of what they've been taught um and so I think that's the sort of the value in it. And generally, I'm just very uncomfortable with any sort of, I don't think I'm doing activism here because I don't, you know, I don't really care if the Mormon church is, or the, is welcoming to gays or not. I, people should go where they want, whatever. Um, but I, I, I'm uncomfortable with anything that, that really demonizes someone for beliefs that, the, unless, the, unless these people are like in a position of power to be, affecting anyone outside of who chooses to be in the Mormon church. I mean, sure, you can argue that they affect the children who grow up in the Mormon church and then hate themselves for being gay. And, you know, f fine. You, but you sort of have to accept what you can't change, I guess, about the world. Yeah, what the Mormon saying, church has actually long. been far more accepting and more progressive Probably. on these issues than many other yeah. religious faiths. And but That's but true. I I in the past so, year. Yeah, it's so interesting to me to hear you do because what you just described it comes across to me as a traditionally liberal perspective towards journalism, towards free speech, towards dialogue. That's what used to be considered liberal. But the progressive perspective that is in so much of mainstream media is hell. We just had this uh, black journalists event where they got backlash and people resigned because they interviewed the former president. They're like, we should and also you had the form him. And I'm like, what do you mean? That's literally the job of journalism is to talk to newsworthy and noteworthy figures. So do you find that your kind of approach to let's have these conversations, let's hear why people believe things, even if I find them harmful or questionable or dubious or distasteful, do you find that that approach is going out of style in mainstream media? Because it certainly seems that way to me. I mean, I guess I would say yes. I I, I um I don't want to summarize all of mainstream media. I think that that liberals, but conservatives as well. Like it, people really like seeing people they disagree with made fun of and demonized. And it if you do that well, it can be very funny. But I don't think. But I have seen a sort of proliferation of material that seems to. I think if you're mocking someone powerless even if their views are idiotic it's just kind of it's just a bit pointless um although now that i say that i'm thinking back to like you know the the pride march that i covered that was my first video for free press you know i went to this pride march i talked to people who um you know are arguably not in positions of power but they have um their ideas have cultural currency though they're right that's very well said. Their ideas have cultural currency. And and it was sort of, I think the point of that was just sort of to show, look at the look at these ideas that have gained such cultural currency and that sort of, you know. And there were tensions also that I think I reveal in that video. Like I talked to this gay 11-year-old boy, like regular old gay, who was saying that like there are people in his class who, uh, who kind of abuse the idea of gender identity and claim to be... Uh, claim a kind of victimhood that, that turns him off. Yeah, I remember so, watching that at the time and wondering, because you wrote about this in kind of your analysis of, of going there, but maybe you can just recap it for us. Like, my, how things have changed in just a couple of decades, right? Like, what was different or even alien to you as somebody who's who's what? Early 30s? Um, oh, gosh, you say all the early 30s. No, I'm about to be 40. And next month, I'll be 40. Ooh. Okay, well, 40. But you know what I'm saying, right? Like, just a little bit older, but not like ancient. Um, yeah. It seems like the whole world has changed in terms of LGBT culture and, and this space, some for the good, but some for the kind of cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, if we're being honest. Um, you know, I talked to the a 10 year old uh, female who identified as. <laughs> she said, I'm pansexual and non binary. And she's there with her with what her her mother and aunt I think who were very supportive and you know you like to see parents that are loving and I don't think there was anything um you know and I think I said and I said to her something like oh you'll go to bed with anyone and she was like yeah and then the her she aunt was like, she's like, <laughs> yeah well the aunt was like not yet I'm pansexual and non-binary how old are you 
Ten and a half. You're ten and a half? Yeah. <laughs> She's pretty confident. And, and you'll and you're pansexual. Yes. You'll go to bed with anyone. Yes. <laughs> not yet. No, I mean, of course, that not yet was cropped out of or cut out of uh, uh, the Megyn Kelly version of it. She ran a clip of it, and she, but she cut that part out. Um, you know, I think there's this, there's, there's a feeling that what's behind this is wanting to sexualize kids. Um, and, you know, maybe that's part of it for some people, but I don't think that these, that this mother and aunt were, uh, trying to sexualize their child. And I don't think that when this little girl says that she's pansexual, she actually means she is having sexual experiences with other I, I just it's no probably not but i i guess now. what they are trying to do though is affirm their child and i i worry that these these more liberal parents are again they're it's good to be open-minded a little too open-minded and your brain can fall out like if your 10 year old's telling you that they're pansexual which is just bisexual with extra made-up victim points indistinguishable well, i would in in defense of pansexuality i do think that it means for i don't see how it's applicable to a 10 year old child but i th when i hear that i think i will i'm attracted to people regardless of sex or whatever gender identity they have adopted so but that's it's how bisexual is that? but it's that's bisexual there are only yes, two sexes and sure it, and it's only Fine. about sexual to me sexual orientation is about sex not gender identity um, so I, I don't know, view yeah. them as indistinguishable, but hey, if you disagree, explain it. Yeah. Well, I think that like, what, like, do, would it include a post-operative trans woman? I mean, th that's someone who is sort of, I just heard this term the other day, kind of medically induced intersex, right? Oh, that I haven't heard that. That is interesting. No, I agree with you that right? yeah, there is a limit, but like to my, my concept of what it means to be gay does not include being attracted to a trans man. I might be initially attracted if I just saw them and didn't tell, but I'm sorry, but for most people's idea include. of gay doesn't involve female anatomy, shall we say. say? Same. However, Brad, what's interesting is that there are people who identify as gay men who who are perhaps unexpectedly attracted to that. I mean, I've met some of them. It but seems that means they're a little bit on the bi spectrum. Well, maybe, in a technical however, sense. They but they wouldn't be attracted to a uh, cisgender woman. They'd be attracted. They are attracted to some, you know, these are, I don't understand it. If there's a vagina there, I'm out. But there are gay men who will take a vagina if it's in the package of a masculine looking man. And I, I don't know. I mean, like, but that's, that's the it. answer there. Then I think that becomes that unlike gender identity, sexuality is actually a spectrum in that not everybody is a hundred percent straight or a hundred percent gay. Some people are a little bit in the middle. And I think that explains that. Can we not have a word then for someone? Because I, I think that there are people who are bisexual, right? In their classic sense. But the minute that someone is trans, that screws it up for them. And they're not attracted to that. Can we allow that there are probably people like that? Bisexuals who aren't interested in trans people? I, I haven't encountered that. But if it would, then they're still attracted to people of either biological sex. And there's two biological sex. That's the hang up for me. Okay. I well, guess it kind of depends whether you view sexual sexual orientation about sex or about gender. And if you accept the idea that there's the gender unicorn spectrum of all the genders under the sun. Well, there, there's a there's a spectrum of gender presentations. I mean, I'm with you. I think that like the, the reason that this is so disturbing to me the or the proliferation of gender ideology, as we say, is that for any kid, for instance, who has any kind of perspicacity like if you tried to explain gender identity the a kid would say or at least i would say if i were like 10 and being taught this stuff about multiple gender identities i'd be like well hold on a minute like doesn't all of this rest on definitions of words i mean if you're a person who identifies as neither male nor female well or neither a man nor a woman well what do we mean by the words man and woman explain and without using crude stereotypes Yes, or, or without being circuitous. I mean, a woman is someone who identifies as a woman. A man is someone who identifies as a man. It's not. It, it's. Just, it is not a definition. You know, there. If there, to, if there are two camps here, biologists and gender theorists, right, and they are both putting forward ways of making sense of the world. 
Well, one of those camps has a definition for male and female that allows us to make sense of the world. And until maybe, I don't know, 2014 or until 10 or 15 years ago, we understood that transgender was something where where the entire point of being transgender was that you choose to live and present yourself in a way that is opposite towards your biology. Right. Yeah. But now that it's was, like that your biology is literally at, whatever you say it is. At some at some point, someone decided, no, it's not enough for us to say that trans women are are biological males who live as females, present as females. Trans women are women. And that like that is where you start having a sort of collapsing of rationality, because then you can't talk about things in a way that reflects what's actually going on. And and that's what's frustrating to so many people. And if and, you do, you, know, you get called a bigot. Yeah, I, yes. And I mean, so the thing that you just said that was so interesting to me is is about this because, for me, it is very simple. And and but even they are trying to make the change that you suggest. The Equality Act, which almost every elected Democrat supports, would literally redefine the term "sex" under federal law, not gender. Yeah. Sex. They haven't read it. Me. How did self ID? Yeah, you're right. Most of them haven't read it. They just HRC told them to pass this. Right. Um, yeah. But I, that's alarming to me because to me yeah. it's very simple. There's two biological sexes. Some people have rare intersex conditions, um, but you can't change your sex really. There are some people who have gender dysphoria, and the best way for them to to alleviate it is to live as if they are the other sex and to take steps yeah. to approximate the secondary sex characteristics. And we but they, were- they Sorry. cannot truly transform into the other sex completely. And, and I, I don't, really... I've never been willing to accept or pretend that otherwise, though I am willing to essentially play along. Like I, I have no issue with it. I just have never been willing to get down to the mantra of trans women are women. No, like trans women are trans women. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we were making really good progress in terms of transgender recognition transgender rights hell i mean thank thanks to gorsuch we now it's now illegal to discriminate against people based oh, on gender daddy. you know so, <laughs> uh we i i oh, it's so funny i wrote a pilot in 2017 um and i ended up shooting it and it and it did well it would have gotten into uh would have been at south by southwest but then COVID happened but anyway um in it i play this guy who tutors um this boy who walks into the room and he's wearing a dress and my character and he's like the most like antisocial horrible child and my character asks him if he would feel more comfortable if i referred to him as a she and um i end up like transing this 10 year old like in my first uh uh meeting with him and of course the parents are like what the hell did you do you know and the uh Gender politics, I mean, I just, it was before we were talking about what it actually means when kids identify as trans or what that can lead to. It was, it was someone with a different sort of politics who wrote that, that pilot. Um, I don't know how we got on that, but I. No, but uh, it is, I do agree with you. I often wish that on both gay and trans issues, we could just go back to like 2017 because I think the last couple of years we've witnessed a pendulum swing in that they pushed, LGBT activists pushed too far. And now I'm starting to see, I have been over the last year or two, actually really ugly backlash on the right yeah. towards yeah. trans people. Very, and gay people, I mean. And gay I, people, very some, some cruel stuff. Uh, we've actually seen even in the polling declines in support for things like same-sex marriage. It's still very popular, but it started to go down a little bit. And I, the anti anti drag bills which are totally unconstitutional and wrong and uh and and a, and a totally unforced error because we decided that it's very very important that we put on dresses and read books to kids oh. and i have no objection to drag queen story hour i don't think there's anything wrong with it do it if you like but politically is this smart is it smart for politicians to be celebrating drag queen story hour so i draw a little bit of a distinction between two things one of which is drag queen story hour which is like clothed drag queens reading books to kids i put that in the category of strange but shouldn't be illegal like do what you want with your kids i wouldn't do it 
but then you will see more rarely, but still like actual drag shows with kids in attendance in the audience that yeah. are like sexual. They've got fake breasts and that kind of thing. I mean, I don't know whether we really need laws or if just the same kind of public indecency laws or, or whatever apply. But I do think that's disturbing. And I don't really understand why anybody would defend that. Like, I've literally seen kids like putting the dollar bill into the drag queen's fake boobs. And I'm like, this is gross. This is not helpful. Why does this need to happen? I mean, I would I would caution you away from drawing huge conclusions about how often this is happening based on anecdotal video evidence. It's a big country. There are a lot of crazy things happening, you know. Yeah. And we see, you know, like if you ask a liberal person how often an unarmed black man gets shot by the police, they'll say anything from 100 to 1,000 to 10,000 times a year when, in fact, that happens around 20 times. And that that skewing of perception is because of video evidence. So, you know. I, yeah, look, I've never really cared about drag all that much. I know some feminists take issue with it. They call it, um, you know, putting on woman face. I actually have always looked at it a bit more as more like mocking masculinity and the standards attached to men than it is blackface for women, which is how some of my conservative feminist friends view it. Um, yeah. But I, I, and I mean, I see why they say that, but I also don't think it has nearly the same history as actual blackface, right? So it's yeah, not the exact same comparison. But I guess I just think that making democrats have rallied around drag it's kind of like a reverse polarization thing where it's like oh well republicans are mad about drag queen story hour so now we're gonna like embrace drag and like put it yeah. in our campaign ads and like wrap ourselves in the mantle of drag queen story hour and i feel like both are are just unnecessary <laughs> i remember what i remember seeing nancy pelosi come on to rupaul's drag race and i thought you know like it i mean why is this happening like what like i just i have you t totally given up on like I would let me see Nancy Pelosi go on like Duck Hunters or whatever the hell that show was. Remember like the or or, or something to reach people who are not drag like gay men. Like yeah, gay like you've got the gay men locked down, Nancy. Go there just seems to be um a total unwillingness to even try to get people from what seems like the other the other camp to vote for you. And I think yeah. that's so depressing. No, it is for sure. And you've actually worked with the RuPaul's Drag Race crew a little bit, right? You mentioned uh, we were chatting before. I don't we know tried I to interview them, but it did not go well. I thought it went fine, but then we heard from the PR department. I was this is when I was at LA Magazine, and they were they were some some there was some promotional event, and they were all in Los Angeles, and I interviewed a few of them, and um, you know, then my editor Scott got. got heard from the PR people they were there were serious concerns that I had you know I had asked one of them about her about her sex life I think I there was a British one and I asked her well now that you're based in America like how are you handling all of the circumcised penises because what the hell else are you gonna ask a British drag queen about who's living in America I mean it just seemed like the obvious question um so I we're at a time when you can't ask a drag queen about uncut penises I mean come on but, I mean, know, it's kind it's of funny. My, it's um, drag corporate. queens, and it's like, well, how dare you ask about sex? Oh, and I think I had asked. I had. I mean, they, they, it was like I was. I was doing my shtick, and there were this PR people sort of off to the side, like overhearing and sort of nervous. And I, I, I get it because there's so much, there's so much ugliness and and uh, actual bigotry in this world that when someone like saunters up to a drag queen and they're like, are you one of the trans ones? I, I can't keep track, which I think I said something like that to Deja Scott, who's like very obviously not trans. I was like, this is a dumb little thing. You know, they just sort of assume that I'm coming from this place of hatred or it's just not, it's just not scripted. It's not kosher. It's a little too, whoa, what's going on here? But that's and that what makes, makes your videos fun to watch. Yeah, and I found like the one company in the world that seems to be able to handle that kind of, um, I don't know. I was it's about like, to say, you're lucky you're working for Barry and the Free Press, who well, are, but um, also somewhat immune to to the same kind of cancel culture forces of mainstream media. Because if you were doing that kind of stuff and working at New York Magazine or something, uh, you wouldn't well, belong to the yeah, world. Probably. I mean, this was at LA Magazine, which which has a lower readership, 
But I was lucky to have editors who like actually stuck by me and they were like, we've watched this footage. He's not saying anything hateful. Like, you, you know, what's your problem? That's great. It's just that is, that is increasingly rare, unfortunately. I was so surprised. I just I thought like, this is it. They're going to tell me I can't do this anymore because, you know, some queer people said that I was offensive. And it was like, you know, I mean, this yeah. happened a couple of times with LA Magazine. I went to a, I was invited to cover invited by people who had seen my videos before and who had worked with me before and liked me. And they asked me to cover um, a party for Playboy magazine with all of these like playmates there in their underwear and other executives from Playboy in their underwear. And, you know, I don't remember what I asked that was so offensive, but I think I, you know, I think I asked one of them if uh, about, uh, about, p I used the porn word to describe Playboy, God forbid. You know, I mean, they've had this whole rebranding. So like, they're not like your daddy's playboy anymore. Like they're like the whole place is like run by women and gay men now. So it's all about empowerment or whatever. There's no magazine anymore, actually. I mean, I don't know what I haven't, I haven't taken a look, but, um, not your cup of tea. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, they, they just, they thought that I was, uh, inappropriate. I was like, you invited me to cover a playboy party with people in their underwear. What? I don't. Yeah, yeah, but that's that's what's fun about your content, though, is you're you you'll ask something crazy and unexpected and capture people's responses. I've always found that a lot of interviews, especially like entertainment journalism, I I, I hate to even call it journalism. It's like I've literally spoken to people who get lists of things they're not allowed to ask about from agents and have to pre-send questions, and it's like in this actual world of entertainment today or or tonight or people or all this stuff they're really barely even doing journalism they're basically like a separate well you had the PR. impression that entertainment tonight was was journalism brad uh, i mean I, not really i but i i've never i've never been into like celebrity news or anything but i've read a couple yeah. books about it recently and it's even more pr run than i actually knew is i yeah. guess i always knew it was not like yeah. hardcore journalism but i didn't realize how controlled a lot of it is well, you asked if I'm getting pushback, and I'm, I get a little bit on Twitter. You know, I had this video out last month about um, the about Matthew Shepard. Uh, you know, his death was reported initially as a hate crime, and there was a play about it. It was, I mean, ever when everyone thinks of Matthew Shepard, you think of a hate crime, and the full story of what led to that is a lot more complicated. And so I did a video about it, and we we did get like some pushback on Twitter, but it was from like three people. And, you know, I do think that if I were in a more, yes, if I were in a, if I were working for a more mainstream organization, like I'd probably, you know, there'd be a bounty on my head, but I guess I'm, I mean, I'm lucky. Well, this has been a blast. Uh, I, I know this is your first podcasting experience, but I, I think you're yeah. a natural. So oh, thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. And uh, I'll t put a link to more of your work in, in the show notes so that people can check it out and uh, we'll have to keep in touch. I agree. Thank you very much, Brad. All right, everybody. That is it for this episode of the Damage Control Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you're subscribed if you aren't yet. And if you're listening to us on audio podcasts, do take a second to rate and review the show. It really helps. Don't forget to hit that like button. Comment with your thoughts. I do read the comments. So let me know what you thought of our conversation. And we'll talk again next week.